Okay guys, at this point in the course, it is time to take your visualization skills to the next level. We have already talked about different the different uh, tactical patterns. You guys have been training that, but now I'm going to share two exercises that I do with my students to help them visualize better, to be able to calculate four, five, six, seven moves down the road and clearly visualize the final position. So the first exercise has to do with these positions in front of you. We're going to work on them little by little and hopefully I can show you how this exercise is going to be beneficial for you. But then I'm also going to go here guys to this website and notice that I already put here chess games of Nepal, right? So you could do this with any chess player you like. I'm going to go to chessgames.com and guys, the, the truth is that any game, if you find a game on a chess magazine, on a chess book, it doesn't matter. I'm going to click on, okay, the Sicilian. We have been talking about this opening and I'm going to open any game, the first one, okay? So this is what you do. And again, this is just one of the exercises, guys. I, I know that I have mentioned it before, but it is important that you start to take it seriously. So what do we do with this exercise? Well, you have the chessboard in front of you, you have the moves, and this is what we do. Typically, when we review a game, we go one move at a time. So we go E4, and then c5 and so on now the way that i want you to do it if you're not doing it already is to use the two by two the three by three the four by four technique what we do is we look at the notation and we imagine the first two moves in our head so e4 i need to imagine this pawn going to e4 then c5 i need to imagine this pawn going to c5 then pawn to c3 and then knight to f6. So I need to visualize that. When I see that on the board without moving the pieces, only then I'm going to go ahead and do the move. So I go e4, c5, c3, knight f6. Now I do the same thing with the next two moves. And guys, if you do this consistently, you're going to get better at it and soon it will not be a challenge. At that point, you move on to three by three and then four by four. And without noticing it, you will be able to reproduce an entire game in your head. It's not gonna be in a few weeks, it's going to take month, but if you do it consistently, you're going to get to that point. Now, very important, even if you never get to the point where you can visualize an entire game in your head, you guys are going to make progress. Let's say you cannot visualize so many, you can visualize only the first 10 moves. Well, that's already really good. And what that's going to do is, when you're playing your games, it is going to be easier for you to visualize, to calculate faster. Now, the other exercise that I want you guys to do as part of your training is what we're going to be doing here with these five positions. Now, if we start with this one, for example, those of you following this course in order, and those of you who have been training your tactics, you guys should have thought of the top candidate moves. And those candidate moves should have been taking the knight, that way when the pawn takes, we just continue to push, the pawn takes, and we get a pass pawn. You, could, you should also be thinking of pawn to b4 with the same idea on the other side. The pawn takes, then you keep pushing, trying to promote, you deflect this pawn, and then you got a pass pawn, right? So these are the candidate moves that should come to mind. However, when it comes to calculating everything all the way until the end and then determining if rook first or b4 first is the right way to go, that's when things get blurry and we cannot see it, especially if we are on the time pressure. So that's why this is what we need to be working on, guys, because you already have a good foundation when it comes to tack pattern recognition. We just need, once you recognize the pattern, we need to be able to calculate and visualize clearly. Now, guys, we're gonna come back to this position, but let's start from the very beginning. Okay, so this one, a lot of you have seen it already because I posted it on the community tab at some point. But anyways, I still wanted to show it to you guys to continue to make that point. In this position, if you get to it, immediately you're going to think of the past pawn. This is a pattern that you are familiar with. You know, it's powerful. And this one is really close to promotion. But we already see that the king could get to it quickly. So we're going to be like, oh, if I could do something to stop the king, to deflect the king, if I could do something to make the pawn promote. Now, if there's nothing and you don't find it, okay, but at least your brain focused on that part of the board. Now, what we talked about uh, a few weeks ago was that the move is knight to e3. If you go knight e3, then the knight is controlling g2 so that when we push, the king can do nothing about it. And of course, if the king takes, well, that's going to be a deflection and there's nothing they could do now to stop 
the pawn. And of course, um, if, they, if they had done, instead of taking the knight, something like this, we push, that's the end of it. Now, before we get to this next one, guys, let me tell you what the second exercise is. It's not just solving this, these positions that I'm giving you. And guys, those of you who are new to the channel, you should know, every time I put a new position, pause the video and see if you can come up with the answer first. And only then you listen to my explanation. What you need is to do these kind of exercises with end games. And why end games? Well, number one, you only have a few pieces left on the board, so it's easier to do this. But also, it is easier to come up with candidate moves and it is easier to calculate for many moves down the road because there are not so many pieces making things difficult. So, I know that there are books out there uh, with artistic endgames and, and things like that, but any endgames book is going to help you. You're going to find numerous exercises that you could just put on the board and calculate. Look, even if you never find the right answer, even if you calculate nonsense, your brain is visualizing, is imagining the pieces moving. Even if you're going down the wrong path, you're doing that. Now, I remember when I used to do positions like this, I knew, guys, that this has to be something about checkmate. Notice how this king is all the way in the corner, these pawns are coming down this way, and we have the king and the knight only. We know this is not enough to do checkmate typically, but we could use the idea of these pawns smothering their own king to do the checkmate. So the pattern, I already know it from before, but I have to calculate how do I make it work. Now, the idea here is that um, I know that I want to look at candidate moves and I want to do a move that leaves my opponent with the least amount of possible moves, right? So in this case, I like knight g4 or knight f1 because I control h2, so the king cannot go there. They only have one move pushing the pawn, and I like that. I like those uh, variations where my opponent only has a few moves. So, if I look at knight g4, h3, now I really want that pawn to get there and smother the king, but I also need my knight to be able to go to f2. So I'm thinking knight g4, h3, king f1, only move, notice how my knight is blocking this guy as well, only move is pawn to h2, and at that point guys, we have to be able to visualize our king is over here on f1, our knight is going to be on g4, and their pawn is going to be on h2. So the king is trapped over here, so all we need to do is knight to f2, and that's checkmate. Now, if you could not follow that, guys, go back and review it again, do it in your head over and over and over. It's not about you coming up with the answer, it's about you being able to follow along, okay? So knight g4, only move, then king f1, only move, and then checkmate. All right, so this one you already saw. Um, here we're looking for checkmate in six moves, right? So only a few pieces left. It should be easier for you to calculate everything, but still we have to be very, very careful and take our time. Now, all of you who started to look at this position, I'm pretty sure your candidate moves were taking over here, trying to deflect this pawn, um, taking on g7, of course, it has to be a candidate move, and bringing the king closer, but notice how this is going to be stalemate. Taking on h6, if they take, well, when you bring the king over to help the pawn, it's going to be stalemate as well. So, how do we make this work? Well, we gotta look, guys, for a way to free our pawn so that we can push it and promote, but when that happens, the pawn, this pawn, has to be able to continue to move and that's how this is not going to be stalemate. So instead of taking here so that the pawn captures and is stuck, I need that pawn to capture my knight on f6. And then that pawn has a few other moves to do and in the meantime I could go 1, 2 and 3. So the, the first step is getting the knight to f6. When the pawn takes, we cannot take guys because then king g8, g7, king h7, Pawn to, I mean, king to f7, and that's stalemate. So what I need to do is, once my knight gets to f6 and they take, I need to sneak in to f7, so the pawn continues to push all the way down, but then I have plenty of time to do g7 and g8 checkmate. And again, guys, if this is already sounding uh, tricky, you cannot visualize it, just follow along, okay? Now, the first stage here is, how do we get our knight from f5 to f6? And this would be a very nice part for you to practice. So how do I get to f6? There are, there are like three or four different ways to do it. To me, remember that we have talked about this. 
If I want to get to f6, where does my knight need to be? Well, it could be here, and in order for me to get there, I need to be over here on d6. So this is going to be my route. I go d6, e8, f6. Now, to get here, you could also be over here. So you could go, guys, to e3, g4, f6. And there are so many other ways you could find to get there. Now, I'm going to choose this one. Now, the king noticed that it only has one move. Then I go here, only one move. And finally, knight f6, and the only move is to take. Just like that. And then I go in, and when the king, when the pawn moves, check followed by checkmate. Now, you saw it, guys, in action. Now, let me see if you can follow along. Let's try to do it without moving the pieces. So we're going to go knight d6, king g8, king e8, king h8. So at that point, the knight is on e8. The king is back here, right? Then knight f6, pawn takes, and king f7. Then the pawn moves, check, they go here, and g8, check, mate. All right, guys, so there you go. You got, we got the third one. We got two more to go, and let's see what you think about the last one. I think you're going to like it. All right, guys, so if you're still here and you're not tired, congrats, because this, this endgame, I always tell you, a lot of people simply don't like endgames. They're boring. And when you're doing it with this focus of visualization, they could be really tiring. So I understand if you're already tired. Now, here, this is the position that we already went over. And we talked about this candidate move, this candidate move. Now, let's calculate. I like to look into the most uh, forcing move first. So I'm going to go ahead and just take. Then the pawn takes. G3. I like this one because I'm threatening to just keep pushing. So if they want to stop me, they got to take. And at that point, I got a pass pawn, two squares away from promotion. I know that I gave them pass pawns as well, but they are far from promotion. So at that point, guys, after all of that happened, I know that I have a pass pawn, but this bishop is the problem. So what if at that point I did something like C3? Well, if the king took, I'm going to collect the bishop and I promote. But the problem with that is that when I visualize this move, I realize they could take with a pawn. Huh. What if I could deflect that pawn? So I'm going to go with b4, pawn takes, a3, trying to promote. And then when they take me, I could do that c3. And then the king has to move or capture. And I capture the, the, the bishop and I'm about to promote. Guys, I know a lot of arrows. This is already uh, confusing. But again, try to follow along. Let me do it one more time. If I'm playing this in a tour tournament game and I see something that I like, I get excited, but I'm not going to do it right away. I could be missing something. And guess what? Many times I have I missed I have missed things. So that's how I learned to double check. Now, one last time, take pawn takes g3 pawn takes then b4. Now, you might be thinking, what if they don't take? Well, if I do b4 and they try to push their pawn uh, over here, then I'm going to be able to do c3, the same thing. Pawn takes, pawn takes, king takes, and I and I go here. So the moment that I did before, pawn takes, guys, here, if your visualization skill is really good, you could see that you have two options, either pushing to a3 and then c3, or you could do c3 first. If the king takes, we know, we get the bishop, or if the pawn takes, then we, we push, right? So I think you could do either one. Now, if we did this in our head, now let's go ahead and, and let's see if this is what you were imagining. So g3, about to promote. So they took. Now, I wish I could get the bishop. I wish I could do c3. So before, then you see here I could do this. And now they have to give me the bishop and then I promote. Or I could have done c3 first, same idea. Or if they take, then I just go a3. I'm going to promote. If the king goes after the pawn, well, I get the bishop. And now they cannot stop all of these pawns. And of course, I'm closer to promotion than they are. All right, guys. So this is the last one. This is the one, the kind of exercises that I hated the most. Because to me, they were unrealistic. They wouldn't happen in a real game. Even though sometimes they did. But at the moment that I was doing this training, I really didn't like it. But anyways, one thing is for sure. The H-pawn is gone, guys. There's nothing we could do about it. And if we don't add quickly, we're going to lose this game. Now, what is the way for us to secure the, the draw and not lose the game? Well, if you calculated something like this, pawn goes king e5, h2, and then take h1, they promote. Well, 
the Black Pieces should win this endgame. So, how do we go about it? If you guys post a video and you found the way to do it, congrats because this is a tough one. Many of my students just cannot even start to figure it out. Now, the idea is to get ourselves in stalemate position. So, how do we do it? King h7, h3, king h8, h2, and then we put the bishop on h7, and when they promote into a rook or a queen, then our bishop is going to be pinned, and that's going to be stalemate. Now, if you are like uh, like Fabiano Carana did recently in a game, and they promote into a bishop, we gotta consider that. We also have to consider after this, king, uh, h3, king h8, h2, and then bishop h7, we gotta, we gotta consider if the king takes. Now, if the king takes at that point, remember my king is here, my bishop is here, and the king just took, well, I could go check, collect the pawn, and I control the promotion square. And, of course, uh, if they had promoted into a, under-promoted into a bishop or a knight, it is going to be uh, a draw anyway. So I'm looking into this, um, h2, bishop h7, now queen or rook, that would be pinned, and I have no moves, so stalemate. Again, if they had done here king takes, then skewer, we're going to get that pawn, and of course we're controlling the promotion square. And lastly, guys, like I said, here, if they had just promoted into a knight, well, this is going to be a draw anyways. All right, guys, so I'm going to leave it here. I hope that you actually got some value out of this lesson. Remember to do these exercises. When you train your end games, try to calculate as much as you can. And of course, review games. Going back here to this website, you could find so many games and just use the 2x2, then the 3x3, 4x4, and so on. And like always, we'll talk in the comments. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys in our next lesson.